Hi, um, my name is Spiros Panagarakis and I'm the Interim Head of Fine Art at Monash University. I'd like to first like to acknowledge that I'm Zooming from Bunurong and Wurundjeri country of the Kulin Nation and I'd like to pay respects to Elders past, present and future. And with that also acknowledge Indigenous friends and colleagues um, here today. At um, Monash University, at Mama and at Mata, we consider the art that we make that we write about, that we present here on this land is always contextualised along a very rich tradition that is 60,000 years old. On behalf of Photo 2022, uh, MAMA, Monash University Museum of Art, and MARTA, Art Design and Architecture at Monash University, I've got the great pleasure of introducing our audience to today's Form by Content Talk, making the, making the visible invisible with the artist uh, Shikali Romanas, Mishka Henna, in conversation with Mark Andreevich. Um, Mark is a professor in communication and media studies at Monash University. Shikali Romanas is a Pitta Pitta woman, artist and researcher and PhD candidate at Fine Art Monash University and a researcher at the Woman Jika Jibana Lab. And Mishka Henna is a visual artist based in Manchester, England, and in 2015 was an artist in resident at the Mildura Art Centre with Daniel Crooks, Julie Goff, and a series of other really great artists. Um, over to you, Mark. Thanks so much. Uh, I'd, I'd also like to acknowledge and pay respects to the traditional custodians of the unceded lands where I'm speaking uh, to you today, the Boon Warring people of the Kulin Nations. I pay my respect, respects to their elders past and present and acknowledge the Indigenous people gathered with us today who may be viewing and of course participating in this discussion. As we consider how to build a better and more just society, may we honour and pay respect to the knowledge embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of country. It's a great pleasure for me to have the opportunity to uh, be in discussion uh, with today's artists. I'm uh, a media researcher and I suppose in, in a gesture that's um, <laughs> uh, I hope not too expansive. I, I think of art as, um, of course, being uh, participating in the media. Uh, and I'm uh, incredibly interested in the ways in which the folks who are working in fine arts uh, anticipate and raise all of the issues uh, that uh, we're engaging with today around questions of, of visibility and invisibility. I, I might preface this by saying we had some discuss discussions as we were preparing for this event around um, how to frame it. Uh, and initially we'd started with this notion of making the invisible visible. Uh, and we ended up deciding to, to flip that around. And, and I think it's a really interesting decision given uh, the contemporary media environment. We live amid a proliferation of screens and images. It seems as if everything is being made visible all the time. Uh, but of course, at the same time, the very proliferation of those screens uh, serves as a form of screening. Uh, and what we don't see very often is what takes place uh, behind the screens uh, and all of the processes for sorting and shaping uh, the mediated world uh, that seems to be increasingly immediate. Uh, at the same time, I'm, I'm, I'm also a scholar of surveillance, and, and I'm really interested in the ways in which um, surveillance moves in some respects from being a spectacular event uh, where we uh, kind of see the mechanisms of surveillance to becoming embedded uh, around us ubiquitously to the extent that monitoring almost disappears through its very proliferation. Uh, I was looking at some of the discussions of augmented reality and the, the idea of what it would take to be able to make an automated reality system work. And one of the claims made by the former editor, founding editor of Wired Magazine was we, we would need to have cameras everywhere recording all the time. And uh, that's, a, that's a fantasy of kind of total exposure of uh, everything being captured all the time. But uh, at the same time, of course, what he was envisioning was a platform that would uh, mediate and sort and make sense of those images in ways that are really beyond uh, the capacity of 
uh, of humans to absorb that much imagery. Uh, and that fantasy of, of total capture seems to characterize so many of the media formations uh, that are arising around us. If you think about things, uh, um, the forms of framelessness, the disappearance of the frame of the border of what's captured associated with things like virtual reality, augmented reality, 360 degree imagery, in all of these ways, this kind of ambition of, of total capture. Um, I, I encountered uh, a few years ago an advertisement for some technology that was designed to uh, address the shortcomings of humans. And it was, it, uh, it was technology that advertised itself by saying uh, that our human's memory is, is flawed. It asked this question, how much of your life do you remember? The answer is statistically around 0.001%, and that's if you have a good memory. Uh, and that was meant to frame us as flawed. We can't capture everything. We can't see everything. Uh, uh, the product they were selling was called LifeLogger. It's a camera that you wear uh, that captures your life in its entirety. And th the idea is uh, your own flaws, your own limits as, as a, a human who can only process so much information would be overcome uh, by this technology, uh, which they described as the next big thing in the high tech industry. Uh, and of course, what that overlooks is the very function of our um, existence as finite beings is based on not capturing everything. It's based on what we leave out as much as what uh, we experience or, or remember. In fact, memory isn't anything if it's, if, um, if it's everything. Uh, and the same might be said of um, describing or narrating uh, an event. It, it's always constructed in part by what you leave out. Um, and so I think this question of making the visible invisible um, is a really nice way to think about what are all of the uh, ways in which the avalanche of images and the ambition of total capture um, might uh, it raises the question of what these leave out and how to think about what gets left out and also what takes place behind the screen. Uh, so I thought that was a really interesting and provocative way to set things up. I, I, I think um, I'll, I'll ask Mishka to kick things off because he was the one who originally proposed flipping it around. Uh, and so Mishka, if I could get you to talk a little bit about uh, why you uh, made that move of, of going from making the invisible visible, which is what we often think of as um, a kind of critical work or investigative work to uh, making the visible invisible uh, and how that connects with uh, the projects that you're working on. Sure. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Um, and thanks for inviting me, everyone. By the way, I uh, I didn't mention that before, but um, it's a real pleasure to to be able to um, meet you all and talk to you across such vast distance. Um, so, I, I, when I worked as a, I worked as a photographer as a documentary photographer for for many years before I became a, a visual artist and. Um, I think one of the great frustrations for me with photography was that was the, the, the kind of power imbalance and the power relationship between the photographer and the photographed. So the, you know, the, the photographer and subject. And um, I think I became much more interested in kind of flipping it around and thinking much more about the viewer and, um, but also about the act of capturing and, uh, and a kind of complicity in that um, in that act, and so um, <clears throat> when I started working like this, it was at the it was kind of the beginning of the Facebook uh, social media era. Um, Google Earth had been going just a few years, um, and it seems to it seemed to me that suddenly it was possible to really flip flip that relationship around in some way that the that the observed could become. Uh, the observer, if you like, that it was possible to, to take the tools of the kind of the, the optical tools of the military industrial complex, which had been um, uh, made available in the civilian domain through the internet, through tools like Google Earth and so on. It was possible to use those tools to, to, to look at the very instruments of um, that military industrial complex. So as soon as you do that, obviously, um, you start to realize that so much effort, that there's a lot of effort that 
goes into hiding stuff. Right? So um, there's lots of things out there that people don't want you to see. Um, and um, I think that the idea of, of making the invisible visible as being a function of art has become almost a kind of cliche because in parallel to that, there are there is this whole other sort of infrastructure, this whole other paradigm, which is very much about, yeah, this kind of seeing seeing everything, but but making those making that eye, making that um, those optics invisible, ubiquitous almost in a way. So it was just a uh, like I said when I started working like this in around two thousand and nine, two thousand and ten. You know, I was I really wasn't sure how long um, this window of opportunity would last for that, that, that you would be able to use screenshots, for example, that, that Google Earth would have a uh, the, the ability to um, save the visual material that appeared on your screen. For example, there's a, on, on your keyboard, there's a print screen, there's a print screen button, for example, which I always thought was really fascinating. It's a relic of early computer technology which has remained um it survived on our keyboards and it does allow us to to capture anything that appears on our screens and so i thought that was really um a fascinating a fascinating tool that i should try to use so i guess i can i can i can start by sharing uh, one of the uh, some of the earliest projects that, um, that i started to work with in that way um and um the uh, one of the earliest ones, which was inspired by the work of um, Ed Roche, really in in um, in America in the nineteen sixties. Um, so I started out making artist books, print on demand artist books, and um, which I thought was always a really fantastic, a great structure within which to work. Um, and um, I made a work called Fifty One U.S. Military Outposts, um, which used Google Earth and uh, and other satellite imaging uh, providers actually like Bing maps at the time um, and a few others I can't remember, I can't remember which which others but these are um, platforms that basically aggregate satellite imagery um, from uh, often from the US military or from civilian satellite imagery providers commercial satellite providers um, and you know it's a remarkable tool really because it's it's a sort of totality uh it's a total vision if you like of the world i, I sometimes refer to it as a you know the, the world as a, as an image of infinite detail now and google earth is a kind of um example of that you know you can you can zoom in and zoom in and zoom in and zoom in and in fact you can go so far you can reach a limit and then it turns into google street view um but basically you have this kind of totality of uh the the globe uh, represented in visual form, but there are different degrees of visibility this in, in, in relation to high resolution imagery and low resolution imagery. And what I found really interesting was that um, if you could pinpoint uh, the mil mil US military outposts across, across the world, almost all of them were in uh, really good high resolution imagery, which gives a kind of, um, uh, signal to, to 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 the optics and the relationship between the optics and the military in the first place. So what I did was I um, I collected uh, all these different locations. So there's 51 US military outposts in 51 different countries in this book, um, and uh, you can see them here. They're usually airfields or storage depots or military bases. Uh, this is commander fleet activities in Japan over here. This is the uh, Air Expeditionary Group in Iraq, another air base. Um, and uh, this is the Ronald Reagan Missile Defense Test Site in the Marshall Islands. So, you know, just working from home, um, uh, it was remarkable to me that I could create this kind of map just as a civilian, this kind of global map of uh, military empire. The one on the left here is uh, an interesting one. This is the CIA predator, predator drone launch site in Pakistan. Now at the time, well, as, as would be now, you know, the, there was great sensitivity about um, whether the US military were involved um, or were, were, were based in any way on Pakistani soil. And um, 
somebody had actually spotted the outlines of a predator drone, a USA, a US predator predator drone on this airfield um, in Pakistan. And so the very act of uh, the, the Google Earth that itself, that the the that the imagery from Google Earth, which had been created in the first place by military uh, satellites, which had then been sort of uh, publicly publicly released years later, that very act of photographing um, the world had revealed to the world the existence of U.S. military uh, uh, hardware on uh, the soil of a country. Um, that, that was extremely politically sensitive to the presence of the US military on its soil. So I loved, I really loved those contradictions. Um, is there anything you want me to, to add to this? It's, it's, I, I'm really interested in the fact that the resolution was so high on the military installations. Did you find that that was, since these were military satellites, they were actually focusing on getting high resolution images, did it, did it drop off if you went to other spaces or was it just uniformly uh, high resolution? Um, no, the, the, well, those, those areas were high resolution and I was always surprised about that. Um, I mean, it, there's, a, there's a different project that I worked on, which well, there's a couple actually, which, which are a kind of counterpoint to that in a sense or, or reveal a different level of, of um, visibility and invisibility, if you like. Um, so uh, I'll share those with you now. Um, so the, the in 20, I think I worked on this in 2010, actually, maybe even before 51 US military outposts, um, but I released it in 2011. Um, and th th this is called Libyan oil fields. And it was basically at the time that uh, NATO, I could, I could sense that the narrative um, was beginning to form around us invading um, Libya, you know, NATO forces invading Libya. And I'm a child of um, uh, 2003, you know, with the invasion of Iraq. So, you know, I marched against uh, that invasion in London, as did millions of, of other um, Brits. And um, uh, I sensed that actually we were preparing again to invade another country. And, um, and nobody was talking about the, the natural uh, uh, water resources in Libya or the oil reserves. The, um, Libya was the only remaining country in the world that had a nationalized oil infrastructure. Um, and it also happened to have the largest uh, supply of natural water reserves in Africa. And, um, and I, I was interested in, do, in using these tools to do a kind of almost a sort of preemptive um, sort of photojournalism, if you like, by, by trying to get in the heads of the military strategists and trying to think about how, how would they look at Libya, you know, in their preparation for war. And um, uh, so I, I turned to Google Earth, which obviously is, was the tool that I was using at the time. And I would find, interestingly, I would find on Google Books, uh, these giant textbooks about oil fields in, in, in Libya and across Africa. And so what I would do is I would superimpose the maps from those textbooks onto Google Earth. And, and the maps in those books would, pin, would show you where the oil fields were and what the names of those oil fields were. And then I would zoom in, uh, in into the Libyan landscape. And what was really fascinating is 99% of the Libyan landscape is desert. I mean, it's just desert. There's, there's um, uh, there's, there are very few urban areas and um, so almost the entire country is low resolution um, very little there's very little high resolution imagery um, of, of Libya in Google Earth to this day actually but if you pick if you superimpose those um, oil fields onto the um, onto the landscape in Google Earth and zoomed in you would find that the oil fields were these little pinpricks of uh, high resolution imagery so uh, these are some of the examples here. Um, you can see all of these on, on my website, by the way. Um, but I found that I found that really fascinating because, on the one hand, almost the entire country was in, was invisible, really. Um, but these tiny little um, gold mines, if you like, of uh, of um, capital generating 
resources were were in really good resolution you know there's really good quality imagery of all these locations which again was a signal to um to the interests that lay behind um this kind of totalitarian vision of the world i found that really really fascinating and then finally uh, a separate counterpoint was after working on 51 years military outposts i was really i was really i couldn't believe how much uh, was was visible and uh, turned my attention to censorship uh, to s the censorship of satellite imagery and I came across uh, obviously there's lots of censored um, imagery on Google Earth but basically different intelligence agencies in different countries use different sort of techniques um, usually they're not consistent at all so the Russians for example might uh, simply white out um, areas in the country or pixelate them or the imagery might just be missing you might just have streaks of you know black across an image um, and uh, so, it, so it's missing but I found that in Holland in the Netherlands of all places there was this remarkably sort of consistent aesthetic um, choice in how to censor the landscapes and um, I, I made a book called Dutch Landscapes again printed on demand um, and um, the interesting thing for me at the time was, yes, the, the censorship is really fascinating, but also the kind of echo between the digital uh, artifacting of the, um, of the landscape with the actual man-made um, kind of um, alteration of the landscape to protect uh, the Netherlands from the natural enemy of flooding. Um, so I found I found in these these patterns uh, between sort of digital imposition of um, Photoshop induced shapes and filters onto these sensitive sites. I, I found a really lovely echo with the um, actual yeah the the entire kind of um, manufacturing of the of the landscape to 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 control irrigation and for flood defences. So the, all, most of these locations that were censored were um, royal palaces, fuel depots, um, military barracks, and so on. But obviously, you know, there's a great, there's a fantastic contradiction um, in these visual um, examples. You know, on the one hand, you've got, um, you know, this kind of very clear uh, urban landscape. Um, photographed in really high quality, great detail, and that is just completely kind of punctured by the, the imposition of these Photoshop filters. So this is an effect called crystallize, which basically takes, it, it, rent, it, it reduces detailed imagery into just um, a series of uh, polygons of colors that kind of, um, yeah, that are equivalent to the palette of the image underneath. Um, and that collision for me, I thought was really fascinating because it, it also signified, on the one hand, it signified that kind of paranoia, that post 9-11 paranoia of on the one hand, everything being visible, but on the other, you know, terrorists could use it, could use that visibility against the, the very system that created it. Um, and then on the other, the sort of transition from a kind of analog age into a, into a digital age. And I, I found this to be a kind of aesthetic sort of equivalent of that, um, yeah. Thanks so much, that's, that's so fascinating. Uh, and, and it kind of nicely highlights the, the kind of ongoing tensions between on the one hand, total exposure, and on the other hand, what gets um, hidden or backgrounded or low resolution. Uh, and I know that uh, Jakarli has also been um, looking, interrogating some of the ways in which um, Google, while on the one hand offering kind of total information capture, is at the same time leaving many things out, uh, rendering other things invisible. And so maybe we'll bring Jakarle into the conversation and uh, if you could speak a little bit about, um, I, you know, your thoughts in relation to that tension between visibility and invisibility. Yeah, for sure. Um, thanks for having me. I'll also acknowledge that I'm on Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung land. Um, it's a privilege to be on Wurundjeri country as a Peter Peter woman. And I uh, ex 
extend my respects to elders past, present and future. Um, Mishka, that last series you were talking about Dutch, uh, Dutch landscapes was the first kind of body of work of yours that I came across. And I think for me, sort of like a nice segue, I suppose, into my work is kind of thinking about um, censorship as well, but again, through making the visible invisible. So I'm kind of coming at my practice um, and looking at sort of Google Earth technologies from an Indigenous standpoint and thinking about, uh, you know, the, the politics of mapping, but also the politics of imaging and how we kind of think about place when it's being imaged in the way that Google Earth is. Um, so I'll just share my screen. Cool. So my kind of initially my practice was sort of centered around imaging self and um, subverting the colonial gaze through portraiture and layering myself into images of country in that way um, as kind of like an exploration of disconnect from from country itself so I grew up about two hours south of Melbourne and Peter Peter country for me is in the western inland region of Queensland not far from the Simpson desert um, but my kind of introduction to Google Earth was during my honours year. Um, you know, I really needed to go back to country and make work. And this was during the beginning of the pandemic. And so I couldn't travel. Um, and of course, decided that I'd utilise Google Earth as a tool to kind of go there. And when I went there, what I saw was quite fascinating um, in terms of kind of this, as we were talking about this discrepancy between high and low resolution, but also what information was actually available about place. Um, and the kind of catalyst for, you know, getting this, this train of thought going was I went and um, went into Google Earth to find this particular tree which is a wadi tree um, and it's a, an important gathering tree for my people um, and the image itself or the way that it had been represented within Google Earth was kind of like reduced to this dark shadow of pixels so this work here is highlighting that um, so the, I've sort of superimposed an image of the tree that I'd made on country a couple of years prior on top of this, you know, Google Earth representation of the, of the same tree. Um, but yeah, I suppose, you know, thinking about mapping <clears throat> as historically been used as a form of colonial control and thinking about historically within Australia, the myth of terra nullius, I think, with my work, I'm really trying to um, highlight that Google Earth itself is a form of colonialism and it is, you know, further ingraining this myth of terra nullius within Australia by not including Indigenous knowledges of place. Um, and so when I kind of say that, it's, yeah, thinking about acknowledgement, you know, of the many different countries that are making up Australia. Um, but also thinking about, you know, how we kind of um, follow or lean towards this Western way of mapping, because ultimately there are many ways of understanding place and mapping. Um, so yeah, just kind of considering all of the different hierarchies that Google Earth is upholding within the technology. Um, but I guess I'm also interested in, in how the technology itself is dysfunctioning and why it doesn't work. So these images that are scrolling by are kind of like a transition between the Google Earth satellite view and street view. Um, and what happens when the, when the technology degrades and disintegrates within itself, um, pitta pitta, is a rural area and a lot of these images haven't been updated for the last you know 
10 to 12 years. So again, coming back to that idea of, um, yeah, placing value on certain spaces and places within Google Earth. Yeah, in a nutshell. Thank you so much. It's um, it's such a that, that historical set of connections is so interesting. I you know I, I think about um, you know the the European um, uh, arrivals uh, in new territories. One of the first thing they did always um, was was mapping, uh, and uh, of course other forms of extraction. But it's it's really interesting to see those um, Google cars driving around. And imagining the kind of digital forms of, of um, uh, extraction and capture that that they're engaged in, um, I, I'm I'm curious if either of you have some reflections about um, uh, you, you, the capability of taking what Google's doing and finding um, you know the types of creative uses that you're putting it to. Um, to, to what it, how do you how do you think about what it means to work uh, on that platform that, that they've created or, or work with it um, what are the what are the uh, I don't know uh, potential hazards or opportunities uh, that it creates if you've got any thoughts on that um, I think for my work I'm slowly kind of starting to consider copyright and permissions. So through making this work, you know, obviously Google Earth has a set of permission guidelines and copyright guidelines. Um, and sort of, I find it interesting, of course, that I'm on a technicality, not really meant to be using these images in the way that I am, but they are images of stolen land and therefore I am kind of, um, you know, taking back a country in this sense or, or basically doing what Google Earth is doing, but just kind of subverting it. Um, so I think creatively it's it's got a lot of potential and I love that artists are utilising it as a tool to kind of, you know, bring things to the fore and um, highlight, highlight things that people can access at their fingertips, but just maybe haven't thought about, yeah. Um, so, I mean, Google is a trillion dollar company um, who have basically um, pretty much taken over our lives. I think it's a fair social contract that artists um, or anyone really uses their services in a way that can suit them as individuals um, in exchange for for Google kind of um, seeping into every pore of our lives and trading uh, our information and commodifying our personal data. Um, so I never doubted or questioned for a second my right as a civilian and uh, artist to make use of their material uh, to make work um, and you know until up till now I've never had any issues really um, I think for one one of the things for me is I think you know I'm I'm really I'm I'm a I, I think of myself as a kind of critical um, viewer really I'm, I'm not a very good consumer Right. That's to start off with. I'm just not I'm not good at buying stuff. I don't need much. Um, I'm much more interested in kind of looking at the world and reflecting on it and critiquing it, really. And I think I, I love the possibility that, you know, these engineers and designers and these blue sky thinkers at Google never thought that somebody like me or Jack might 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 use their tools in these ways you know I mean obviously they they have enormous blind spots you know it's really fascinating to see 
how Jack's using the technology, because obviously these are huge cultural blind spots that expose, you know, power dynamics and ways of thinking about the world that, that are very specific to those engineers that design the software, you know, and, um, and, and it's become so ubiquitous and it's become such, such a dominant paradigm that people don't think about those things. People don't consider those things. Um, even I refer, when I refer to the, the world as an image of infinite detail, you know, I guess I'm so I've, I'm I'm drinking the Kool Aid, if you like. I'm kind of, you know, that would that would be the dream of these Google engineers. But actually, I think what what's what I'm also really interested in is these sort of blind spots, these 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 kind of glitches and breaks that reveal a sort of deeper ideological underpinning. And and what and, and probably for me the one of the most um key aspects really is is this kind of is the rampant capitalistic urge to commodify and exploit um and the imagery is just one aspect it's just one more tool um for that what i found really profoundly moving and and um also really just socially and philosophically important about both of your work is the way in which it highlights and thwarts, um, uh, 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 let's put it this way, highlights the impossibility of the fantasy of total information capture. You know, there's a, there's a kind of smoothness to these digital platforms uh, that's uh, underwritten by the ideology of, of the, you know, kind of tech uh, proselytizers, which is, Yes, we can capture everything. We'll get it all, uh, and it's so impossible. Even even Kevin Kelly's vision, you know, with uh, of cameras distributed everywhere that would capture everything. Um, you'd need then a camera for every camera to capture the camera, right? You know, you'd there's some kind of impossibility to this fantasy, and yet it persists, right? You know, this this idea of of total information capture is um, so key to these online information economies that uh, imagine they can gain certain types of control over uh, what's taking place if they can just get everything. And the, and the solution is, you know, in a sense, um, always more data to the point of total information. And what I think what both projects or all, all of these projects that we've looked at, they kind of um, highlight the, uh, the seams and the blind spots and the deadlocks in that fantasy. That seems super important to me in this data world that, that we're entering uh, to highlight that. Um, I, I, yeah, yeah, I just wanted to add, there's this really fascinating um, story. It's another glitch of sorts, really. There's this guy called Jim Gray, who's one of the key architects of Google Earth. He was sort of a, uh, a, an amazing kind of engineer who, um, who, who found a way to basically kind of aggregate all of these different um satellite imagery systems into into a into a whole which eventually resulted in um uh google earth actually uh, there was a there was a platform that preceded google earth um but that was basically what google earth was was built on and um he set off uh in a little schooner in a little boat to go and scatter his mother's ashes uh, off the coast of San Francisco. Uh, there's a set of islands, I forgot what they're called now, but about 30 miles from, uh, from San Francisco. So it was actually a really simple, um, a simple journey to make for, a, for an experienced sailor, which he was. And uh, so he was traveling on his own and his, um, his boat was equipped with the most sophisticated, advanced kind of beacon uh, tracking systems and so on. And he set off on an absolutely beautiful uh, blue sky, still waters day for these islands. Um, and he disappeared. He was never seen again. And um, uh, there was this extraordinary effort by friends and colleagues who worked at Google Earth, who worked for, for lots of different satellite imaging uh, companies to, it was in the early days of Amazon Turk, actually. Uh, is it Amazon, Amazon Turk? Is that Mechanical Turk. Mechanical Turk, that's right. Yeah. Uh, it was in the early days of Mechanical Turk, and there was this extraordinary project to basically 
um, see if they could find uh, Jim Gray's boat uh, in the ocean, right? Using all of this different satellite imagery. So what they did is they literally recalibrated satellites to, to make passes over the space between San Francisco and these islands. And they studied hundreds of thousands of, of images looking for a single white pixel, which represented Jim Gray's boat. And they never found his boat. They never found it, even though it was equipped with the most sophisticated tracking systems. Um, there was never, he had a family. Uh, there was never any sign that um, he wanted to disappear, but he completely disappeared. He, he vanished. His boat was never found and nor was Jim Gray. And I find that to be a really fascinating kind of, I don't know, moment um, that, that points to the limitations of this technology by, by, the, one, by one, uh, uh, the, the disappearance of one of the very architects of the technology and, and Silicon Valley's attempts to find him using um, these technologies, but actually the, the ocean swallowed him up. Um, and I find that I find that really uh, pertinent in some way. I don't know. I thought it, I'd share that story with you. Yeah, no, it's it's very interesting, and it again highlights the the blind spots. Um, the anxiety, of course, is that is that the response is, well, we just need more satellites recording all the time, <laughs> and we could have reverse engineered it. There was a, a there was a city. I think it was Baltimore. Um, that hired a company called Total Information Systems that actually, I think, it pioneered during the Iraq War. This this guy who claimed to be able to um, fly a plane over the city uh, 24 hours a day and capture uh, in high resolution the entire city 24 hours. And this was an anti-crime uh, uh, um, move with the idea that you'd have a complete record that could be rewound and fast forwarded. So, you know, if something had happened the night before you could go and rewind uh, to that night before and rewind before to see you know what led up to that event and then fast forward after to see where everybody went but it was a it, it was um uh, not just a spatial capture but a temporal capture right you know if, if you could capture the sequence as well as the as the space um and it was some, of course, you know, uh, millionaire who was funding this to, to imagine the possibility of, of total, uh, total capture. Um, but of course, your story, again, I think, highlights the, the omissions and the, and the deadlocks. Um, and and Jerk, I, th I think, you know, what you were talking about, the f alternative forms of mapping, uh, indigenous forms of knowledge, and uh, different ways of thinking about the relationship between time and space. Um, also, I think, against that background, highlight that it's a very particular model uh, uh, um, of information capture that those fantasies uh, envision, a very particular way of knowing space and knowing time. Um, and uh, it, I think it's, it's great to kind of uh, have your thoughts about, you know, what, what might alternatives to that be? Because I think we need alternatives, right? It's, it, the direction doesn't seem to be uh, a constructive one that they're headed in. Mm, definitely. And I think, you know, to touch on what Mishka was saying before, sort of constantly critiquing, just not accepting these technologies as neutral tools, like there's always an agenda. They are subjectively made. Um, and so I think as well, you know, a lot of people take these on face value and think of them as like scientific and neutral, but um, ultimately, yeah, everything has been designed and engineered. Uh, there's a particular reason why something has done, been done the way that it has been done. So yeah, I think just um, through my work, kind of bringing that awareness of, of you know, indigenous histories in Australia, but also considering, you know, if, if a collaboration was to happen between Google Earth and, you know, different Indigenous nations, like, is that possible? Um, you know, I don't, I don't think it is, largely because of issues of things like data sovereignty and 
um, you know, who would have the ultimate kind of ownership and control over these technologies if such knowledges, you know, Indigenous knowledges were incorporated. Um, yeah, very, very interesting, all the data stuff. Yeah. Jet, can I, can I ask you that this issue of ownership, that's obviously a really, um, that seems what, what what you just said there that the the issue of ownership seems to be a real sort of key thing around which the, the whole subject would pivot is that right i'm just interested yeah i think as in i mean there's you know different layers of ownership there's ownership of intellectual property there's ownership of data ownership of land um i think ultimately all of this stems from just acknowledging the, the histories and uh, acknowledging that Indigenous peoples are the traditional custodians, um, you know, that we are the owners in a sense. And through these technologies like Google Earth, this is constantly reiterated as, as false or, or there's no opportunity for that to kind of, yeah, be acknowledged. So I'd, I'd say it definitely is, an issue of ownership on, on many levels, yeah. I, I think that that question of how it's put to use is also, uh, so, uh, you know, ownership of the systems of sense-making that um, uh, absorb and digest these kind of huge volumes of, of, of images. Um, one of the things, again, that, that I really appreciate about the work that, that you're doing is in a sense, it's a counterpoint to the automated processing of, uh, of the images or the treating of the images as operational in the way that Trevor Paglin describes them. You know, what, what if you de-operationalize them um, and uh, even took those ones that are difficult to read or, that, uh, or the ones that jam the system and, and de-operationalize them? I, I remember reading about a, a researcher who, who became quite uh, well known, I think, subsequently, um, who had, was doing research on using Google Earth to make inferences about socioeconomic levels of uh, of neighborhoods by looking at the types of cars that were in the neighborhoods. I think that was, you know, it was uh, it, very much a kind of marketing logic, right? There, there are ways in which you could automatically process these images to make inferences about um, that might have, again, monetary value or, or some instrumental use. Um, and uh, I think she eventually got hired by Google and then <laughs> um, kind of turned back against them <laughs> and got fired. Uh, but um, that, that question of, of um, the difference between kind of creative, um, artistic human sense-making and the machinic uh, processing of these images seems to be uh, um, a, a really interesting point of kind of struggle and, and critique. Uh, I don't know, I thought I'd see if you had any thoughts about how these images um, can be used in automated ways. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess the, the human interpretation gets in the way maybe, you know, of, um, of the smooth automated uh, machinery you know, it's, I, I think that's, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because all the, the stuff that, all the issues that Jack's discussing really go to the crux of that, which is what, what else is going on? You know, what other, what other cultural, um, what other ideological forms exist that completely that run completely counter to that entire to that kind of you know Silicon Valley um, paradigm, you know, and there are so many, and so I wonder. I mean, I mean, in a way, you know, those blind spots that uh, that Jack mentions are sort of you wonder whether actually, you know, there should be real efforts to to, to maintain those as blind spot as as blind spots you know in that in that um infrastructure right because actually so long as it remains sort of low resolution hidden not well documented you know there's possibilities for 
that there are there are great opportunities and possibilities for for alternative things to grow um maybe i don't know i don't know what you think about that Joe. yeah no, i i think yeah i think definitely there's there's agency in withholding details and so i think it's important also to acknowledge that you know even if this out of world collaboration between Google and um, Indigenous peoples was to happen, you know, there could be, or there very likely would be, um, you know, there would be a case of pretty much being like, no, I don't want, I don't want country imaged, I don't want it published, I don't want it shared or accessed by everybody. Um, so yeah, it's like this interesting kind of you know, there's there's pros and cons, or a lot of cons actually, between sort of having all of this accessible and um, you know leaving it as it is, but also, yeah, I think these images all exist within a context, and I think to not acknowledge that context is damaging, I suppose. Yeah. Do you know it would be fascinating? I I think it would be so interesting if uh i'm wondering what everything that that would expose a collaboration between what you're describing and google would explode all of those sort of taken for granted hidden assumptions about ownership and about rights and about that would be really fascinating because it would be two you know very different ways of thinking about the world colliding you know and the failure of that collaboration would really would reveal so much about the dominant paradigm you know what i mean i'm sure mm -hmm. people would people would be fascinated in uh, in the failure of that collaboration because of everything it would teach us about what google expects from that from, from it from its social contract with its users you know what i mean yeah um, absolutely mm, i feel like i feel like it for all of this for indigenous knowledges to be um you know correctly kind of shared i suppose it would not be a collaboration that there, there would collaboration would not be possible i don't think um yeah and it would be i'd love to see it fail because ultimately you know that teaches us a lot about the way indigenous knowledges actually work you know it's um yeah we we they are just so opposite we cannot comply with western ways of knowing or western ways of understanding place there's just no kind of yeah it's they, they can't really coexist so <laughs> well i would love to be a fly on the wall in that meeting now you know between be, between the google executive and you know someone like yourself and to to hear the negotiation between you know what would google expect what could google because on the one hand you kind of think you can you can totally imagine the google mindset would be oh this is fantastic this is amazing this is a way for us to to broaden our you know appeal to to think out of the box to think differently right so you take all of that sort of um all the aspirational um stuff about you know silicon valley culture and apply it to a scenario like this where ultimately it would completely fail based on that kind of aggressive capitalistic you know colonial impulse Right, which they would still, which would still be at the heart of everything they do, but is this just completely, you know, unconscious, taken for granted, but expressed absolutely concretely in the terms and conditions, you know? So I would, I, I think that would be a really fascinating. Uh, it would, it would, it would sort of, yeah, it would show the chasm. Um, between what they're doing and uh, an alternative visions of the world. Mm, absolutely, I'll, I'll give them a call tomorrow. We can, we can we'll, set, we'll set up the meeting and, 
I'll, I'll have you on the phone somewhere hidden so you can <laughs> overhear what's happening. Um. <laughs> It sounds, in a way, coming full circle, the, the failure, um, and it would be more than a glitch, it would be, a, as you say, a chasm, um, would reveal, make, make something visible that uh, I, I think was already visible to some, <laughs> but would make it uh, more widely visible and uh, perhaps visible to Google. Um, uh, it'd be interesting to see how they tried to fold that, fold that back in. Uh, but it's a very, it's a really interesting point. There's a, there's a, there's no third position from which these two positions can be mediated. They're, they're non, they're non-compatible. Um, um, I'd, I'd like to give a huge thanks um, to um, uh, both, both Chuk and, and Misha, Mishka for um, sharing their work with us and for uh, the open conversation that you've had about it. It's been fascinating speaking with you. And thank you also for the, uh, the work that you're doing. This, um, it's the type of work, it's one of the locuses of hope in, in an era that's, that <laughs> looks pretty um, bereft in, in some respects. So thank you for your work. Thank, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate being able to chat with Mishka. I'll be honest and say that I admire his work so much. So to have the opportunity to kind of speak with someone who's been involved in this work for, you know, the better part of 10 years, I suppose. It's like very, very cool. So thank you. Oh, well, thanks, Jack. Uh, well, I'm, I'm thrilled that uh, you can find something in it, you know, and uh, equally, I'm, I'm really interested in what you're doing. It's, and I hope you'll keep in touch because I'd love to see um, what else, what you're, I'd love to see more of what you're doing and see how you progress. Um, I'd also, I'm just going to pop in um, and I'd like to thank um, Chikali and Mishka. I, you know, what was interesting about the talk was, the, you know, the, I guess the insidious kind of control mechanisms of the state, but the paradox of that is, is that the images come out like so aesthetic. So there's this, there's this, um, I, 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 I guess when looking at the, at your artworks, your respective artworks, you know, I'm, I'm kind of thinking about those kind of, you know, those systems and those systems of control and surveillance, but also, you know, what, what is being produced and the outcomes are so aesthetic and so beautiful. So um, it is kind of very complex artwork. So thank you very much, Mishka and Jakali and Mark for facilitating this really fantastic um, conversation. And thanks to Muma and Mada for, for organizing and, and hosting it really appreciate the work that went into that. Um, it's been fascinating for me. I, I um, really am inspired by uh, the creative work that, that you're doing. And um, for the things I think about, it connects with all of them. So it's, it's been wonderful for me. Thank you for that.